My beloved brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ, our meditation hymn this morning is hymn 357, <coughs> the beautiful encouragements, take courage, be thankful, be prayerful, be joyful, my brother or sister. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
My dear brothers and sisters, now Lord Jesus Christ, a very warm welcome to all to be here this morning. Uh, to people that are tuned in on, on the Zoom, we also, or YouTube, we give you a, a warm welcome. The following visitors, Brother Kevin and Sister F Sue Ferguson from Southern Highlands in New South Wales. Brother Phil and uh, Sarah, Sister Sarah Maslin from Shirley Ecclesia in the UK. Uh, Brother Nathaniel and Kylie Hunter from New South Wales Riverwood Ecclesia. Uh, Brother Brian and uh, Shelley McCarroll from Bustleton, and Sister Hannah, Caitlin, and Bridie McCarroll also from Bustleton. To all of you, a very warm welcome to be with us this morning. And we trust and pray that we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship and encouragement together. And that hymn starts off with in, in such a, a positive manner as well, didn't it, brothers and sisters? Um, and we come here to receive encouragement to receive strength from God and to provide it to others also, to stretch out our hand to our brother, forgetting our own troubles and looking to the needs of others. We're going to commence our worship together this morning by the singing together of hymn 148. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us over the world's temp tempestuous sea, hymn 148. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Thank <laughs> Yahweh, our wonderful and gracious God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one from whom comes all life and all being. As we bow before you in this place this morning, this place where we have the privilege and the comfort to come in peace, unmolested, that we can be encouraged from your word of truth, that we can be lifted up upon life's path. 
that we can refocus upon the ideals that you have set before us, the wonderful promises that you have made to us. May it be Heavenly Father this morning, we might be enthused by those things that we consider from the pages of your word. Strengthen us, encourage us, lift us up in all your ways. Our prayer is also for our brothers and sisters throughout this world, wherever they meet together in your name. And for those who, as a result of difficulties of one form or another in their lives, are unable to meet, that your blessing might also be upon them. We pray for the coming of your kingdom, when your son shall return to this earth and set up your kingdom, where men and women everywhere throughout this world will acknowledge you and praise you. We thank you for them this morning in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The exhortation this morning by Brother Klaus is to the theme Seven Pillars for Daily Living. Now, to assist us in beginning to uh, look at the subject this morning, we're going to call upon Brother Axel Jansen to lead us in the reading of Philippians 1, Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9. So, brothers and sisters, reading together then from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, 1 to verse 9. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eudicus and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose name are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Thanks, Brother Axel, for that reading. We're going to continue our worship together by raising our voices with the words of Hymn 165 Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way. When I am sad at heart, teach me thy way. When doubts and fears arise, teach me thy way. Long as my life shall last, teach me thy way.
To assist us in our preparation for partake of the emblems, we're going to invite Brother Klaus to come forward and to uh, deliver his prepared remarks on the theme, Seven Pillars for Daily Living. Brother Klaus. Thanks, Brother Greg. Good morning to you, my dear brethren and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. How should we live while we wait for our hope to be made real? And while we wait to finally set our eyes on our Lord Jesus Christ. To help us answer this question, we will be looking at the nine verses that we read together this morning. So you might want to have that open in front of you as we go through our thoughts for this morning. These verses give us seven practical guidelines for our daily lives as brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ. This section contains some very comforting and helpful verses for us that hopefully will help us work towards joy and peace in our lives and give us something to think about as we start this brand new week and as we are one week closer to the coming of our master. So the first pillar for us from the writings of Paul in chapter four is when Paul says that we need to stand firm in the Lord. So that's from chapter four and verse one. And he urges his brethren and sisters in Philippi to stand firm in the Lord. Now, the love of Paul for his brothers and his sisters is very clear to see in this verse. It was earlier on in this very same letter that Paul told them that he loves them with the same tenderness and with the same love as the Lord Jesus Christ. You might, you might want to go back to chapter 1, verse 7 through to verse 8. And this is what Paul tells his brothers and sisters in chapter 1. He says, you have a special place in my heart so it is only natural for me to feel the way that I do. All of you have helped in the work God has given me as I preach the good news and talk about it here in jail. God himself knows how much I want to see you. He knows that I care about you in the same way Christ Jesus does. So Paul is very clear about the love and the tenderness that he feels for his dearly beloved brothers and sisters here in Philippi. And in verse 1, he carries on with that same loving tone. He calls them his brothers and he says that they are dearly loved. He says that he longs for them. And for those of us in this room who have feelings of longing for people that we love, we could empathize with how powerful a word that is when we are longing to see someone or we are longing to be with someone. Paul calls them his joy. He calls them his crown. 
And we know that that word crown has the meaning of a victor's wreath, which is the wreath that was placed on the athlete's head who'd won the race. There are so many beautiful terms of love and affection just in verse one for us. And Paul is saying that his brothers and his sisters are his pride and his joy. And that is such a beautiful and heartfelt phrase when we express our feelings about others. So what was it that made Paul feel like this about his brothers and sisters? Why was he so strongly attached to them? Well, it was because of how they had partnered him in the gospel and what a vital role they had played in his preaching efforts and in their support of him in his walk to the kingdom. And so here in verse one, he is pleading with his dear friends to keep on being faithful. He is pleading with them to keep on standing firm in the Lord. And perhaps for us this morning, we need to stop. And it would be a good moment for us to take these words from Paul and picture him writing them to us. And for us to check ourselves as to how firmly we are standing in our Lord. We know from our own lives that there are many things that can make us wobble and that can make us lose our firm standing in the Lord. Our trials and our tests can make us lose our footing. Our problems can be overwhelming and they can make us wobble. Our own doubts and our own fears can make us anxious. Our weaknesses and our choices can make us wobble in our standing in the Lord. Our love of worldly things can make us wobble. There are so many things in our lives that can cause us to lose our firm standing in the Lord. And so with these words, Paul is urging us to make Jesus Christ the very center of our lives so that every single choice flows through him first. We would do well to always have the phrase of what would our Lord Jesus Christ do at the front and the center of each and every thought, word, and action as we live. So how then do we stand firm in the Lord? What else do we read about in God's word about this? Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, we've got the words of Moses. And Moses promised that God would always be with us. And Moses says this, you don't have to turn it up because I can read it out for you. He says, be brave and be strong. The Lord your God will always be at your side. And those were words of Moses just before he died. And that's what Moses is urging them to do. He was saying, be brave and be strong. Why? Because God will always be at your side. Paul tells us, my dear friends, stand firm and don't be shaken. Always keep busy working for the Lord. And so we can stand firm in our Lord if we follow Paul's advice and we always keep busy working for our God as God wants from us. Paul carries on with some more advice for us. Be firm in your faith. Stay strong, be brave, show love in everything that you do. And so there's another way in which we can stay firm in our Lord is if whatever we do and no matter where we are, we show love towards each other in everything that we do. We would know from Paul's writing to Ephesus in chapter 6, we can stand firm in our God if we dress ourselves in the armor of God. The truth that we love so dearly needs to be like a belt around our waist. The righteousness of God needs to be over our heart as a breastplate. The need for us to preach the good news of the gospel should be like shoes on our feet. The faith that we have should be like a shield for us. God's saving power should be like a helmet on our heads to protect our minds. And the word of God should be like a sword. And we should pray without ceasing. So Ephesians chapter 6 and the image of the warrior is an image of someone who is standing firm and how we can do that and what we need in our lives to do that. 
Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul gives us some more words, and he says, above all else, you must live in a way that brings honor to the good news about Christ. Stand fast with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And so Paul has got so much advice for us as to the importance of standing firm and how to do it. And in chapter 1, verse 27, he says, what we need to do as part of standing firm is we ought to live in a way that brings honor to the good news. And I guess that's a good chance for us to assess our lifestyles. So the first pillar for us, for our daily lives, is to stand firm on our Lord. And we ought to just take some time to reflect as to how we're going with that. Philippians chapter 4 and verses 2 to verse 3 gives us the second pillar. The second pillar from Paul about how we should be living in our daily lives is when he urges us to be of the same mind in the Lord. So basically what Paul is urging us is he wants us to stop arguing with each other. And Paul pleads with these two sisters, and he pleads with them to be of the same mind. Now, Paul knew that some help was needed, so he called on his loyal yoke fellow to help these two ladies. Now, this was a nameless person in this verse, but some people think it could have been Silas or it could have been Luke that Paul called on to help with these two sisters. He also asked Clements to join and to help, and he asks the rest of his fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So that's the information for us from verse 2 and from verse 3, we'll carry on in a while, is there's these two sisters who are at odds with each other. Now, Paul knew the value of togetherness. And so he took the very unusual step of naming the people involved in this rift. Now, we notice in verse 2 that he speaks to each woman in turn as he names them and as he pleads with them. Now, can you imagine what that would be like if you were called out in public and named like that in a letter or from the platform? Imagine this morning if I knew that any of you seated here were at odds with each other and I singled you out and called you out by name. Everyone would sit up straight and be wide awake and there would be a sense of shock and awkward tension. We don't know what the cause of this conflict was between these two sisters, but it was having a negative impact on the meeting. And we would know from life, sadly, it does not take too much to cause a lack of harmony and a rift between people. That is true inside our homes. That is true for our place of work. And that is true for life here at Cosmos. Now, what we know is that if we have a situation of two people facing off against each other, one thing is always certain to take place, is that the spectators start to take sides. And before we know it, disharmony and discord has spread and leads to others being sucked in or facing off with each other. And Paul himself is careful not to take sides. And he wisely chooses not to get drawn into the conflict. Now, what we need to understand from these two verses here is that these two sisters were not just a couple of troublemakers in the meeting. Verse 3 tells us that they were partners in the gospel and they were seasoned followers of Jesus Christ. They had worked alongside Paul in the cause of the gospel together with Clements and with others. And I guess what we can take home from that is that we can all get off track sometimes no matter how long we've been in the truth and no matter how experienced we are. And when we do, we need the help of others to make things right. The word help features here in verse three. And that word carries the idea of taking hold of a hand and bringing someone together with your hand. And that is what we should do in how we help each other and in how we mend rifts. You see, our names are in the book of life. And that very fact should inspire us and motivate us to get along with each other right now. And I'd put it to you that life is all about us learning how to love. If at the end of the day, we kind of ponder the meaning of life and what it is. Life is really about us learning how to love. 
God wants his family, that's us, as his brothers and his sisters and as his children, he wants us to be known for our love for each other and not for our rifts and not for our hurts and not for our conflict. Paul was so hurt and so shocked when brothers and sisters in Corinth were splitting into hostile groups and even taking each other to court. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 5, we know the words well. He had some very strong words for them. I say this to your shame. Aren't any of you wise enough to act as a judge between each other? And so he questions their wisdom in how they were going about the issues. He carried on with these words in chapter 10, and he goes, my dear friends, I beg you to get on with each other. Don't take sides. Always try to agree in what you think. Now let's come to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, and we'll have a look at all verse in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we know the Sermon on the Mount really well, and this verse we could probably quote off by heart. <clears throat> so Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, Jesus in his teachings on the Sermon on the Mount says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Now, we need to look very carefully at what Jesus Christ said here. He did not say that the peace lovers are blessed because we all know in this room that we love peace. We hate conflict. We hate the butterflies and the anxiety and the tension that exists with conflict. We all love peace. Jesus does not say blessed are the peace lovers. Jesus said that those people who work for peace and look to solve conflicts will be blessed. And it would be true to say that people who are peacemakers are rare because peacemaking is hard work. What we need to understand is that peacemaking is not running from conflict or running away from a problem. Jesus was called the Prince of Peace, and he certainly was not scared of conflict. Being peacemakers also doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be run all over and used like a doormat by others. The Lord Jesus Christ would often stand his ground and not back down when he was confronted by evil and by error. So how then should we deal with conflict? How then do we become a peacemaker in a way that is godly and in a way that is honorable? We don't have any time to get into it into any great depth this morning, but here are some brief thoughts that might be helpful if this is an issue for us in our lives. Firstly, dealing with conflict, we should always talk to God before we talk to the person. In other words, we should pray about it first without gossiping about it. And when we do that, what often happens is that God changes either our heart or he changes the other person without our help. So prayer is vital. The very first thing to do with any conflict is we've got to get on our knees and we've got to pray about it. We have to talk to God about the situation. The second thing is we should always make the first step. We shouldn't sit back and wait for the other party to make the first move. Jesus says this to us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23. So if you are about to place your gift on the altar and remember that someone is angry with you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Make peace with that person and then come back and offer your gift to God. That's Matthew 5 verse 23. And those are extremely difficult words in terms of making peace with others making peace with others, make peace with that person first, and then come back to the offer, altar and offer your gift to God. You see, if we wait too long, we might get bitter. Our hearts might get hardened. And that quite simply is a senseless thing to do, as that only hurts ourselves in the process. So the second bit of advice about dealing with conflict is make the first move. Don't wait for the other person Thirdly, we need to speak less and listen more to their feelings and not just be driven by facts and by solutions. It's certainly not a wise thing to try and talk a person out of how they are feeling. Psalm 73 verse 21 says this, 
when my thoughts were bitter and my feelings were hurt, I was as stupid as a wild animal. And those words ring so true for us, don't they? We all act beastly when we hurt. And we need to practice patience. And patience comes from wisdom. And wisdom comes from our God and from our prayers. And it comes from listening to others. It comes from people knowing that we care. So perhaps a way to deal with conflict is to speak less and to listen more. And that's difficult because sometimes we hurt and we're so obsessed with our own feelings. The fourth thing to deal with conflict is we do need to confess and own our part in the conflict. Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, words we know so well from Jesus as well, from the Sermon on the Mount. First, take the log out of your own eye, then you can see how to take the speck out of your friend's eye. Now, those are words we learn in Sunday school and they're memory verses and we know them. But when it comes to the crunch, we seem to forget them. And I think quite simply because we all tend to have blind spots. So it's always worthwhile to ask for the help of a third party to help us with our actions. And we need to humbly admit our part in any conflict. We don't need to play the blame game or the shifting game. Because if we admit our part, God willing, hopefully that will lessen any anger and further hurt. The fifth aspect in dealing with conflict is we always need to choose our words wisely. Proverbs tells us a kind answer soothes angry feelings, but harsh words stir them up. So that's how we deal with, con with, that's how we deal with conflict is we make sure we choose our words carefully. We will never make our point when we are mad. So a soft answer is always better than an angry one filled with sarcasm. And so I, I would put it to us this morning, if there is conflict in our lives right now, and if we are at odds with someone, then maybe it's time to do something about it today before the sun sets. Talk to God about that person, then pick up the phone and start the process. It's not easy, but when we work for peace, essentially what we are doing is we are doing what, what God would do. And that is why peacemakers are called his children. First Peter says the same thing, give up your evil ways and do right. And then he says, as you find and follow the road to peace. And that's what we need to do. We need to find the road and follow it as we do right and as we make peace. So those are just some thoughts from verses two and verse three about that second pillar of always agreeing with each other and being of the same mind. And if there is conflict, Perhaps those are some ways in which we can go about choosing to resolve it. If we come back to Philippians chapter 4, we can now come back to pillar number 3 that Paul tells us about, about our daily living. So Philippians chapter 4, and this one comes from verse 4. So the third pillar about daily living is that we must always be glad and be joyful in the Lord. And that's from verse four. And joy has been a major theme of this letter. And here we have it again. Paul says, be joyful in the Lord. And then he says, always. It does not matter what is going on. It does not matter what our circumstances are. Paul says, be joyful in the Lord. And we sit here and we go, how can that be true? How can that possibly be true? And it's almost like Paul knew that we would have that feeling. So he says it again. Because he knew the first time our jaws would probably drop at the power of that sentence. And so he says it again. To understand that concept and that verse of joy, we need to understand a few things up front. Firstly, what is the focus of our joy? If we know what the focus of our joy is, the verse will become a lot more sensible. The focus of our joy is quite simply our God and our Lord. 
And it's because of that focus that this guideline becomes possible for us to get right in our lives. This is not simply a phrase like people might throw at us and say, don't worry, be happy. Or if you're watching The Lion King and you go, Hakuna Matata. It's not that. This statement from Paul has teeth and has clout to it. We take joy in our God and not in our circumstances. Our circumstances might be awful or they might be blissful. It doesn't matter because our joy has nothing to do with them. Life changes with its ever-changing landscape. It'll always challenge us with its ups and its downs and things we don't understand. But in all of this change, the object of our joy is our God. And our God is good. He's ever loving. He's all powerful. He's all wise. And he never changes. And in that, that gives us joy. The second part of joy. So first of all, we've got to make sure that our joy is focused on God and that God is the source of our joy. Because if we place our our focus on other areas that might give us joy, we're probably going to be disappointed. Secondly, being joyful is an action. It's not just a feeling. We tend to think our oh, joy is just a happy feeling. Joy is more than just a feeling. It's an action. This is important because we can't always control our feelings, but we can get to choose our actions. No matter what we are feeling, it is possible to choose joy as an action in the Lord. The third thing about joy is that we need to understand that joy is different from happiness. Happiness, as we know in our own lives, might come and go. Some days we wake up and we're just not feeling it. And that might be due to work, circumstances, situations, tests, trials, problems, and we're just not feeling happy. Joy is different from happiness. We know that our happiness tends to come and go. But joy is a settled confidence and knowledge that God is our God, that he knows what he's doing, and that he's right. And when we trust God, it's possible to be joyful in him, even in the most desperate, desperate and darkest of times. Now, the fourth thing about this pillar about joy is that we need to understand and know that it's okay to be sad. This might seem strange, but we can be sad and still joy in the Lord. We think of Jesus. Jesus wept when his good friend Lazarus died. In Acts, we read that the godly men that buried Stephen mourned deeply for him. 2 Corinthians 6, Paul says this, we have been punished but never killed, and we are always happy even in times of suffering. Although we are poor, we have made many people rich, and though we own nothing, everything is ours. So there's nothing sinful about us being sad. It's right for us to feel sorrow about sin, about breakups, about tragic happenings, and about death. But we can still feel joy in our Lord through our tears and through our sadness. Now, people sometimes ask us when we walk in the door, they say, how are you going today? And sometimes our reply is this. We go, well, under my circumstances, I think I'm doing as well as, my, as, well as I can. And perhaps we need to reset that answer. We as brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ should try and not live under our circumstances, but we should rather aim to live above them. Christ is risen. Christ is alive. And we pray that that will give us tremendous comfort and joy as we try and live above our circumstances. The fourth pillar from Philippians chapter 4 is in verse 5 for us. And in the King James, it's the word moderation. And in newer versions, it's the word gentleness. And the verse says that we must let our gentleness be shown to all. Now, this is such a transforming verse as it's got every single thing to do with our attitude towards others. The word gentle means gracious. It means humble. It means patient. The word is telling us that we need to put up with the faults of others. And that's quite a big sentence, isn't it? If we think about our lives and the people within it, and Paul is saying we need to put up with the faults of others. And this morning would be a good time for us to reflect and ask ourselves as to how we are going 
in putting up with each other's faults? Are we patient with each other? Are we humble as we deal with others? Or are we bossy and full of ourselves? Are we filled with mercy and pardon? And the key point here from verse 5 is that our gentleness, gentleness must be shown to all. It's not something that we can just show in certain parts of our lives at certain times of the day and only to a select group of people in our lives. Our gentleness is shown to all. We need to show it in our homes. We need to show it right here at the hall. We need to show it to our friends. We need to show it to our neighbors. We need to show it to our co-workers, even the ones that are hard to get on with. We need to show it to the waiter or the waitress. We need to show it to the person at the checkout counter at Coles. We need to show it to the telemarketer who calls us. Gentleness is shown to all. And that's difficult. Sometimes we would know because I think we'd all acknowledge that we've got some rough edges that need to be smoothed over as we tend to be pushy and harsh at times in our dealings with each other. And so what Paul is telling us is that when people look at us, they should see gentleness. That's the virtue that's shining out of my face and out of your face. And that's, that's, that's a pretty powerful verse. So be gentle, but with everyone. And then the reason for us needing to be gentle, and this is where the real power of the verse, I think, kicks in. We need to be like this because the coming of our Lord is near. That's the reason. <clears throat> now, each person in this room, the reason why we live and breathe is because we want Jesus to come back. We are waiting for our kingdom and for our master. That's what we're living for. Nothing else matters. Jesus Christ is coming back, so let's be gentle and treat each other well while we wait. The fifth pillar for daily living is from verse 6 and verse 7 of Philippians chapter 4. Here Paul tells us that we should not be anxious and that we need to pray. Now, some versions make that really simple when they translate it, and some of the newer versions go, don't be anxious about anything and pray for everything. And you've got the contrast between the anything and the everything. So don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. Now, what I would like to say about feeling anxious is that we should not beat ourselves up if we do feel anxious. We are all prone to times when the cares of this life are heavy and our souls are sore and our hearts are heavy and we find that our faith is coming second to our feelings and when the words for prayer become very hard to find. We all have times when we get anxious and when we get worried. And I'm certainly not going to stand here this morning and say that you not that you should not feel anxious and that if you are anxious, it's a sin. That wouldn't be helpful if you're sitting here feeling all stirred up with butterflies in your tummy, full of cares and concerns about problems and issues. That would simply add extra stress to your mindset. We know that being anxious has so many causes and so many different reasons for it being a part of life. I'd put, quite simply like to say that these words of Paul here from chapter four can just give us tremendous hope and comfort, and we can take them into our hearts and into our minds. They're there to help us move away from that state of being anxious towards a state of trust, towards a state of faith, and towards a state of peace. And so he's urging us to pray about everything. And I'm not sure about your prayer life, but we can pray about the really big things that are happening in our life, and we bring those to God. We can also pray about the really small things that are happening, and we bring those to God, and we ask for his help in everything, is what Paul is urging us to do. Now, you would have noticed that in this little verse, there's the word thanksgiving that's tucked away as part of the teaching for us. Now, what normally happens when we pray 
is we usually think about thanking God after he has answered our prayers. But this verse perhaps is teaching us that even as we are asking God for something, as we are presently involved in the prayer, we can be busy thanking him. We can thank him for being our savior. We can thank him for being our God. We can thank him that he hears prayers and that he answers them according to his wisdom. And so we should pray with a heart that is full of thanksgiving as we pray for small and for big things in our lives and in the lives of others. And perhaps every time we feel anxious, every time we get beset with worries and stress, let's try and turn that anxiety into a prayer. And if we're able to do that, then God gives us the most beautiful promise in verse 7. God can and will fill us with this supernatural, with this God-given peace that goes beyond our level of human understanding. Now, what's really important is this peace does not come to us because God has given us what we've asked for. We don't get that peace because God has answered our prayer in a way that we want. That peace comes because we have asked him. Because we have prayed about it. Because we trust in his will. And because we've left it in his hands. Now, it does not seem possible that we can have peace in the most dire circumstances. But Paul says that this peace of God is going to keep our hearts. It's going to keep our minds in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful promise that is. Now, the word keep there means to guard. The word guard is that when a soldier is on duty, guarding a city to make sure everyone is safe. And our hearts can be kept safe with the peace of God. And it's possible because it's a God-given peace. It is possible to feel that peace when you are told by your landlord that you've got to move and you've got one month to find a new home for yourselves and the rental market is crammed. It is possible to feel that peace when you stand in the car yard and hand in your car and your keys because you failed to make the payments. This peace does not make sense in the world's eyes. But it makes sense when we know God and when we trust God and as to how he works in our lives. The sixth pillar comes from verse 8. The sixth pillar for us for our daily living is we need to be aware of how we're thinking. We need to spend our days and our nights being careful about our thoughts. We know that if we put garbage into our minds, we'll probably get garbage out into our lives. And whatever we feed our minds with has such a powerful influence as to what we do. And Paul spends some time here telling us what the basis of our thinking should be. So when we assess our thoughts and thoughts, and we know we have millions of thoughts every day and our mind is busy and just thinking about everything, our thoughts should be true is what Paul says first up from verse eight. So if we're thinking about things They've got to be true. So that means we're thinking about things that are real and we're thinking about things that are honest. It means we don't tell lies. It means we don't listen to lies. It means we don't live in a fantasy world and in a make-believe world. We, we deal with truth and things that are true. The second aspect about our thinking is that our thoughts should be noble. This means that they should be full of honor. We don't think unworthy thoughts and we don't spend our lives with our mind in the gutter. Our thoughts need to be full of honor. The third thing about our thoughts is that our thoughts should be right, which means that we think about things that are upright. We think about things that are just. We think about things that are proper. And if we're watching a lot of Netflix, we're probably not filling our mind with things that are right or proper. Our thoughts should be pure and lovely. This means that we should think about things that are holy and pleasing, and that ultimately whatever we're thinking is going to bring out love as an action. And that's the key, isn't it? That's the key, that whatever is happening in our mind, whatever our thoughts are, the end result of that has to lead to love as an outcome and love as an action. 
And Paul sums it all up at the end. And he says, think about all the things that are excellent or praiseworthy. That's what we need to think about. And so for this morning, we can just assess how we're going in our thinking as a pillar of our daily lives. We know that Romans chapter 12, verse 2, is that well-known chapter about transformation. And we all know how it's done in the mind. Our mind is the absolute key because if we let God change how we think, then when that change has been made, we will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to him because the change has been made in our thoughts and in our mind and then the actions will flow from that. That is the key teaching of Romans 12 verse 2 that we know so well about transformation. And then verse 9 brings us to the end of these pillars for daily living. The seventh pillar, Paul says, is put this into practice. So he's told us about standing firm and about being joyful and being gentle and watching our thoughts. And he's gone through the six things that we need to do. Verse nine, seventh pillar, do. Don't just think these things. Do them. We haven't come here this morning because we just want to sit here and listen and then leave and have lunch. We have come here so that our lives might be changed. And if we take what we've learned, if we take these pillars and we put them into practice, then we're on the right path. We know that we have the God of peace. We know that. We know that we have a God of peace who wants to draw close to us. And we know that we can have this supernatural peace of God that goes beyond human understanding. We know that we can have that. Those are two beautiful promises, the God of peace and the peace of God. So as we break bread and drink wine, our minds turn to us thanking God for him being our savior, to thank him for the joy and for the peace that we can have with him bringing us to him through the sacrifice of his only son. Let us ponder these seven pillars and let's take great comfort in the fact that from verse 13, that Christ is our strength and that we can do all things through him. Thank Brother Klaus for his encouraging words of exhortation this morning. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 10 as a prelude to partaking of the emblems. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my laws into their hearts and their mind, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brothers, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of, Christ, of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having a an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Let us give thanks for the bread. Almighty Yahweh, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the salvation that you've offered to this world. We are sinful creatures. We have a proneness to sin as the sparks that fly upwards. And yet, Heavenly Father, you have provided your dear Son as an example 
as a way that we can follow, as one who demonstrated that you and you only are righteous and that we should abhor sin, repudiate sin, and to do things that are pleasing in your sight. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his example and the bread on the table that speaks to us of his sacrifice. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we struggle day by day, as we strive to come to grips with the, the, the natural tendencies that we have. We offer to you our thanks and our praise at this time. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Amen. At the Last Supper, Jesus told his disciples to partake of this bread in remembrance of him. Let us likewise give thanks for the cup. Eternal, almighty creator, you who have called us to be your sons and daughters and have given to us the hope that we can share in your own divine nature, we thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, gracious God. We are so privileged to be associated with you Help us day by day that we might remember that privilege, that we might remember that association, that we might behave and act and think as your sons and as your daughters. We come at this time to remember particularly your only begotten son, the one who showed you to us, the one who demonstrated to us how to live according to your principles, according to your words. And we thank you for the wine which speaks of his poured out blood, to speaks of the life of dedication that he poured out totally in your service, every moment of every day, as he acknowledged that your will be done and not his, as he acknowledged that you are right and that the sins of men are wrong. We thank you for the blessing of this cup, and we thank you in the, our Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Jesus also told his disciples to partake of this 
of this wine in remembrance of him. memorial hymn this morning is hymn 244 wherever lord thy people meet there they behold thy mer the mercy seat <laughs>
Good afternoon, Brother Greg and my dear brethren and sisters. Here are the announcements for the forthcoming week, God willing. After the memorial meeting today on glass washing, we have sisters Naomi Smith and Lynette DeVries. Tonight, we have at 6pm our Chinese English seminars. And also, we've pulled in a international speaker, I believe. Brother Phil Maslin is actually going to take the place of Brother Ben tonight to lead our lecture around the topic of our problems, God's answer, environmental catastrophe. And we've got our brother Greg Hearn as chairman and the supper sisters, Sister Catherine Carmody, Sister Megan and Sister Lisa. On Tuesday evening this week at 7.45, we have our monthly AB meeting and all are welcome. Wednesday night at 8pm, our brother Greg is to lead us on the study there, the name of God in the New Testament. Chairman on that occasion is brother Joel Carter, and our pianist is sister Megan Carmody. On the door, we have brother Baruch and the supper sisters, sister Gabby Derricky and sister Glenda Skipper. For our Wednesday night class, our brother, brother Greg has asked that I read this uh, little introduction to get our minds thinking. Dear brethren and sisters, the anomaly of the absence of God's name in the New Testament has perplexed believers for a long time. The fog caused by copyists and translators has covered up and concealed God's name from the text. We are now unraveling the deliberate confusion caused to support Trinitarian ideas, and the deception is still happening in new ways today. On Wednesday, we will look at the question, who is the Lord? Paul in Ephesians 4 says that there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all. Who is the one Lord? There is great confusion on this subject. But Paul tells us that there should only be one Lord in the New Testament. I believe that this will help move away the myths, mists that have deliberately clouded the issue caused by people that believe Jesus is God and do not want to identify God of the New Testament with the God of the Old Testament. We will have a new look at the inter internal evidence of the New Testament itself. So that's on Wednesday night by Brother Greg. Coming to next week on Sunday, the 5th of March, Brother Jason has advised that there will be no Sunday school due to the long weekend. 
we will put up a camera just to see who does turn up, but there is no Sunday school next weekend. The memorial meeting will start at 11 a.m. Our exhorter is to be Brother Russell Taylor, Chairman, Brother Neil Stagg, our reader is Brother Peter Jansen, and our organist, Sister Priscilla Williams. On the door, we have Brother James Bain and Brother Frank Smith serving, Brother Paul Skipper, Brother David Slater, and Brother Havel Spina, and visitors for next week, Brother Bill and Sister Gabby Derricky. And hall cleaning this week is in the Moore family, the Smith family, and the Jolly family. Next week, there is also no Chinese English seminar due to the long weekend. Just a couple of forward general announcements. Our special effort is now only three weeks away, uh, which is to be led by brother Darren Taporis from Sydney. And his theme is the power of his presence. And we've got some flyers done up. So we'll have that on our new um, timeline wall just over there, also on the notice board and they'll be uh, sent out to everyone as well. So that's our week long from the 18th of March to the 26th of March. The other forward notice, uh, which is a little bit three weeks after that is Pinjarra Bible School is now less than six weeks away and we would encourage anyone who is planning on booking in to do so. This will assist us with the planning for the school and bookings can be made online or see a committee member if you require assistance. There are only two homes available, so if you are planning to organise a home, please be quick. There is also still room for bookings as well. We look forward to another uplifting weekend together, considering the book of James under the theme, The Faith That Works. And those studies will be led by Brother James Jolly from Tetragali in South Australia. We also ask that the visitors who have joined with us this morning, if they could take the fraternal greetings from the Gosnell's Ecclesia with them when they return home. And this week, we've got two collections. We've got the Ecclesial Fund in the brown bag, and the additional collection that was announced last week is for the Australian Christadelphian Youth Conference, which will be in the green bag. Brown bags for the Ecclesial Fund, the green bag is for the Youth Conference Fund. Brothers and sisters, it's been good for us to be here this morning. 
And as we share in fellowship with each other after the meeting, we've had a time of encouragement, a time in which we've thought about the principles of God's word and about not only learning and listening, but doing as we go forth from this place. I'd like to thank those who participated in the meeting this morning and contributed as well. And our final hymn this morning is hymn 200, uh, 383. Rejoicing in hope and the joy of salvation. Father, we thank thee the morning draws near. Shadows of dread brood above every nation. Dark is the night, but the vision is clear. <laughs> great and glorious creator we know that you have a wonderful plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it and although there is shadows of dread brooding above all nations of this earth. As people of this earth wonder what future horrors they're going to come, as the tidings of war come to us, and we know of nations that wish to try to dominate other nations, we know, Heavenly Father, that eventually all knees will bow to you and to your Son, and we look for that time when the tribulations, when the difficulties, when the frailty of human nature today will be done away with, when we'll be lifted up and we'll be able to run and not tire, when we'll be lifted up as with eagles' wings. Heavenly Father, we look for that time 
And we ask your blessing at this time upon our brothers and sisters in particular who are suffering the difficulties of, of, of age and of sickness and of mental anxiety and stress. We ask your blessing upon them that they might be strengthened and encouraged by the hope of the vision that we have, that their vision might be clear, that we might see and respond to the hope you have set before us. Be with us throughout this forthcoming week or so, that we will remember the things that we have considered this morning, and that they won't be just words, that we will go forth and do your will, that we'll act according to those things that we have learned and that we know. We praise you and we thank you for all your graciousness to us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you. 